Okay, here I want to start getting into the uh, lock method. This is by James Scott Bell. And what I've done here is just put together a very quick gloss, very quick summary of some of his high points, or the highlights of uh, his lecture series. But if you want more detail on this, and I would strongly suggest this, recommend that if you are uh, at all interested in creative writing, if you want to write novels, short stories, or stories for games, you have to see his series. Uh, so he's got a lecture series on the Great Courses Plus called, uh, I think it's called something like How to Write Successful uh, Best-Selling Fiction, something like that. I'll put a, try to remember to put a link to that for you in the somewhere. Uh, I'll put it in the notes. Uh, but you can watch that for free through the City Library, is what I'm told. Uh, or you can just pay to get some access, watch the lecture series. Uh, he's also written a number of books, goes over the same material, so if you'd prefer to read it instead of watch uh, the lecture, ser uh, lecture series, you can do that. Uh, those are on Amazon. You can get them on your Kindle. Now, what I've done for you is I've uploaded the guidebook that, Lock, or that uh, Bell provides with the course that he teaches uh, in the content section on D2L. So again, that's just a quick summary of the lectures, some notes, but you know it gives you a pretty good sense of what he's about. And it's, it's a lot better than nothing, uh, but I think, again, if, you wanna, if you're serious about this, you'll want to get the, uh, the lectures and the books. Uh, but anyway, I'll just, again, quickly go over his main concepts. I think this will help you with your Twine game. So he's got what he calls the LOCK method. LOCK is an acronym, of course. It stands for LEAD, OBJECTIVE, CONFRONTATION, and KNOCKOUT. So you might be wondering what some of these are. Well, <laughs> guess what? <laughs> we'll go through each one. And it's a lot of fun. You know, there's so much about writing. You might be somebody that's read a bunch of novels, seen a bunch of movies, and you know what you like, you know what you don't like. You're like, that's boring, that's exciting. But never really thought about why, you know, what makes the difference. And you might also think that, well, that's just because this writer is such a genius. You know, the author has been so inspired. You know, that's how they're able to do these things. Uh, when really, it's just about a formula and knowing, like, how to structure things and knowing, like, what to do, what not to do. And once you get a feel for this pattern, uh, you can just spit out, you know, great stories uh, every day. <laughs> you know, if you, even if you're just like a dungeons, uh, dungeon master, you want some good stories, you can use the same method. Uh, so I think it's just really good for everybody to know this. Uh, anyway, let's get on to the L, uh, the lead. So this means the lead character, main character of your story. And some examples, Katniss from The Hunger Games. Uh, she's a positive character, a hero character. You know, there's many, you know, think about any story where there's a sort of good good guy or good gal, whatever. Uh, the hero persona, that's uh, uh, positive leads. You could also have what's called a negative lead. So somebody that starts off bad. Uh, the reason that we like those is that we want to see them do better or seek redemption, become better people. So Katniss starts off good. Uh, of course, Scrooge from the... Christmas story, uh, Charles Dickens, you know, of course, he starts off as, as an evil, selfish, stingy guy, uh, but over the course of the story becomes a good character at the end. Uh, then we have anti-heroes, uh, so Bell uses an example of uh, Rick from Casablanca, a classic film. I'm trying to think of some from other movies. I guess you could talk about maybe somebody like Han Solo. Uh, from Star Wars, I would say he's kind of an anti-hero. Doesn't really fit in too well. He's not sort of goody-goody character, right? He, uh, he's kind of a bad boy, if you will. Uh, of course, they end up doing the right thing, and that's what we hope they'll do, even though at first they're reluctant to, to uh, do the right thing. Uh, so the main thing about a lead character is you need to be able to identify and sympathize with that character. And what a lot of people will do is, un maybe unconsciously, they, they put in what's called a Mary Sue as their main character. And I don't have that listed on the slide, but the, the Mary Sue is somebody who's perfect, that's you know way smarter than everybody else, that every, all the other characters love. You know, the classic example is somebody like Wesley Crusher from Star Trek, but you know you could think of many. <laughs> so, you know, fan fiction's kind of notorious for this. Uh, so you put in this character that's brand new, but, and yet it's like kicking all the butt. <laughs> Doesn't really face any serious opposition. That's very uninteresting as a reader. Nobody wants to read this Mary Sue story. 
You know, instead what we want is a character that's, first of all, in some kind of a physical danger or emotional danger, right? Something's going to happen. Something bad could happen to this character. Uh, so that's what makes it interesting. We want to know, like, well, are they going to be able to avoid this? Are they going to be able to, uh, you know, escape the danger or overcome the trauma, uh, the emotional danger, whatever that is? Uh, second, they're going to be going through some kind of hardship, not of their own making. Uh, so they got some kind of trouble. You know, maybe they're wounded. Maybe they have a vulnerability to something. Maybe they're going through tough times financially. You know, you name it. There's something there that's very stressful for them. And then they say, the, or Bell says, but don't make them whiny. <laughs> like, nobody wants to read about this whiny character that's complaining about all the stuff. You know, we kind of want to read about this character that's kind of just shrugs it off and it's tough and, you know, just makes it through, doesn't complain. Uh, underdogs, another option. So an underdog is just a character that you feel like uh, is kind of scrawny looking, but yet still has to face the bully. You know, you feel like the odds are stacked against the, uh, the character, but they're still able, they're so strong, they're so committed and devoted, they're able to win. You know, think about all the movies about sports, uh, sports movies where the team is very unlikely to win for whatever reason, but they... They have that determination and that drive. <laughs> you know, that's a, it makes a lot more interesting story than if you just have a story about a star athlete who's just good at everything and never has any trouble. Uh, making them vulnerable somehow. All right, so some kind of weakness, you know, some kind of a vulnerability. You know, maybe they're fighting a temptation of some sort. Uh, <clears throat> maybe they're trying to overcome a bad habit. Uh, who knows? Uh, it's up to you to come up with that. Uh, but the idea is that they're, they're not flawless, right? There's something about them. Of course, I think about S Superman. You think, well, Superman, he's super strong. He's basically invincible. But kryptonite <laughs> is his vulnerability. Like, that's his uh, weakness. So every even Superman has to have some kind of vulnerability, something that is there to make it tense, you know, give it at least a possibility he could be defeated. Uh, Bell also says that, you know, they should be likable. You know, I would agree with this. You know, you don't want to read a story just about some hopeless jerk, you know, unless you think maybe the jerk can change or the jerk is just such a jerk it's kind of humorous. <laughs> you know, I think about that show Curb Your Enthusiasm uh, with uh, Larry David, and he's not necessarily likable. He's just kind of a very selfish, self-centered kind of guy. He's just so goofy, though, and... Like, you, you kind of watch it thinking, you know, I hope this guy can sort of wake up. <laughs> you know, so he is kind of likable in a weird way. It's, it's kind of hard to describe. He's certainly very witty, but I think we can kind of relate to him. You know, I'd probably put him in this category of anti-hero uh, or maybe even a negative character. Uh, but somehow it works. But, yeah, usually it's going to be somebody you like. I mean, we like Captain Kirk. We like Picard. Uh, we like Katniss. You know, no, not too many people say they hate her. <laughs> like, what? Uh, okay. So anyway, they're likable, unselfish, basically good people, but some kind of inner conflict. And so these two, these warring emotions, the struggle they're going through. Uh, I think about Rick from The Walking Dead, how he is, uh, He's. I think people say, yes, he's a very likable, he's a very good, honest person. He's very unselfish. He puts his life on the line for people he doesn't even know. Uh, on the other hand, he's kind of a, con conflicted over his relationship with his wife and his relationship with his kids, or his uh, kid, rather. And there's a lot of tension around that. Like, does he is, should he be more loyal to his own family? Or should he make decisions that benefit the community, uh, even if it might you know, mean putting his own family in danger? You know, so there's all these kind of conflicts all the time uh, in the show, and it goes on and on. So... Even though I think everybody would say, yeah, Rick's a good guy, he's a good good person, yet he struggles with all these dilemmas all the time because you have two different values values that are in conflict. Uh, so to help you start thinking about this, think about your favorite game, mo movie, film, whatever. Think about the lead character and make a list of the factors that you think increase your bond with that character. So how is it that, that you identify with that character Try to think about that. Like, why do I identify with that character? What is it that draws me to that character? 
and then think of some things that the character does that demonstrates those factors. So I just was saying things about Rick. I said, Rick's a good guy. You know, Rick values the law, whatever. So try to pick out a scene or two that something that happens in the comic or the show that demonstrates that. So I'm not just saying he's a good guy or he's honest, but try to think of some examples because this is what's going to help you become a better storyteller is being able to show that, not just tell it. Okay, that was the lead, the L. Now we're up to the O of the objective. <clears throat> so the idea here is what is your lead trying to get to get or get away from? So what is there? Why are we reading this, right? The character wants something. They want to win the Hunger Games, right, and feed their family. Uh, they want to uh, thwart the evil mastermind's uh, uh, plan. Uh, you know, Rick's trying to get away from the zombies, <laughs> get his him and his family away from the zombies, right? So they have some kind of objective, uh, some kind of mission, a quest, uh, you name it. That's the O. Now, the key, though, to making it a good story is it's not going to be easy for them to get this or to get away from the zombies, right? There's all this opposition that they're going to have to overcome. That's the, uh, the C. Or C. The C is the confrontation, right? What is confronting them? What is, I know, I guess O wouldn't quite work for the acronym, but <laughs> the look method. <laughs> uh, but something is preventing them or inhibiting them. So Bell says you have to make things tough, for this lead you really want to read a story and you're like damn this character is just really having a hard time man it's like one thing after another how is he ever going to get away from these zombies you know he just can't catch a break you know that's, that's kind of the stories we like uh we don't want it to be too easy like oh well he just uh, you know he, he finds this uh secret formula and now he's immune to zombies you know where's the story there there's no there's no that's not exciting it's only exciting if there's a big, uh, you know, uphill battle. Same thing like with the sports movies. You don't you don't want to watch some movie about this excellent team that wins every game without a problem. I mean, that, that's no fun. You know, just looking at if you watch the Super Bowl, you know, people talked about that was a, really the best Super Bowl I've seen in you know many years, and it was just because of that. Uh, the tough, it was very tough. It wasn't an easy win, uh, and I think that's what made it exciting. It was unpredictable. I mean, you didn't really know how this thing was going to turn out. Uh, so you want your stories to have that same kind of excitement. Uh, and they talk about the villain in the story. So you might have a character in your game that's that's trying to defeat you or the boss, you know, whatever. So they say, if you want to make it, or Bell says, if you want to make this a good story, you want to work on that villain. And so this villain should just not be this cliche you know, twirling mustaches. <laughs> I am evil. <laughs> you know, not very much fun. That's just silly. That's like childish stuff. Uh, instead, you want the, this villain uh, to, in, in his or her own mind. They're good people, right? They, they they feel like they're morally justified. They've got a good reason uh, for opposing the lead. You know, we can think about this in the sports analogy. It's not like the other team is evil you know we can understand they want to win you know they have just as much reason much desire to win as the, the lead character does or the team you're rooting for does so it's not like you're looking at this and thinking well they're evil no you know it's, it's about the competition or you could think about stories where there's a you know maybe the confrontation could be with the cops or the a detective that's trying to stop the uh, the hero from doing something because that it's illegal maybe the person has broken the law so it's not as though this, uh, you know, detective is evil. The detective has an understandable motive. We understand, like, why he wants to capture the uh, lead character. Uh, it's just that, uh, you know, there's confrontation there without it just being reduced to, well, this, this person's evil. All right, then the knockout just refers to the, the end, right? You really want to end this on a high note. You want to just cold, completely overwhelm the reader. <laughs> wow. You always love this. You've probably done this when you read a really great book. I think The Hunger Games is one. And it's just so good. You know, you get you get to the end of the book and you're like, oh, this is so good. I can't, I've got to get to the next book. You know, or the same thing with the Harry Potter books, right? As soon as you're done, you like want to grab the, you want to immediately pick up the next book and start reading that. And that's the knockout ending, right? 
but or it's one that just kind of sticks with you. I think this is the reason why people love Titanic so much. You know, they saw that movie Titanic, and when it was over, they were still thinking about it. You know, it just kind of stuck with them. That feeling that was so intense. It was so emotional. Uh, you know, a lot of movies are like that. They stick with you. You don't just forget about it instantly after it's done. So that's the knockout ending. Uh, so there's a couple of ways we can go about this. They talked about a little, if you read the, the guidebook that I supplied here, it gives you a few suggestions. You know, this little things uh, at the end to show that your hero has, uh, or your lead has evolved somehow, developed somehow, changed. Uh, that can be effective. Uh, but also just something, you know, something for us to think about after the story's done. You know, that works out pretty well, too. Okay, so that's the lock system. Uh, now we're moving into what Bell suggests in terms of a structure. And I want you to use his structure in your twine games. So that means you'll have these three acts. Act 1, Act 2, Act 3. And you don't necessarily have to put all these elements just like he does here. Some of these are just things you might consider putting in. Uh, or you could just copy this exactly, that's fine. Uh, but I think this is really good advice. And I see this in tons of games. <laughs> Basically every good game uh, follows these acts, uh, this structure. Uh, so anyway, the act one is the beginning of the game, your game obviously. So right away you want to have some kind of disturbance. Something is going to happen to your lead character that will throw that character you know, out of their comfort zone, Something is happening. There's, there's something on either on the horizon or maybe it's already occurring uh, that's going to disturb their status quo. So something is about to <laughs> flip their life, <laughs> flip them on their, uh, their heads, right? Uh, so you could be, again, you could just do this start right away with the, the thing that disrupts the, that, or you can sort of build up to it a little bit and make some suggestions about it. Just kind of depends on... Uh, whether you want a really uh, strong opening or maybe ease people into it. You know, it's just kind of a choice you make. Uh, some other tips they, uh, <clears throat> they suggest there, or Bell suggests, is the care package. So this is something I've, since I came across this guidebook, I've been looking, every time I watch a show now, I look for this stuff happening. So what he says you should do as a writer is after you've opened your story and introduced your lead, you want to show this character doing something nice. <laughs> so just doing something that's selfless, something that really shows this is a good person. You know, maybe they're stopping to help somebody. Uh, maybe they are, uh, you know, donating. Maybe they're passing by uh, a homeless person and they will stop and, and talk and Maybe give the person some money or what, whatever. Uh, maybe just petting a dog or uh, just doing something uh, that really shows you this is a good person. Look at what they're doing. They're stopping. You know, maybe they're spending some time with their kids. Uh, you know, you name it. But there'll be something in there uh, that shows you these are this person cares, right? That's the care package. And then the trouble brewing. Uh, that means some signs that things are about to go south. So maybe there's some comments there. If you got a husband and wife, maybe the wife says something that makes you think, hmm, that doesn't sound too good. <laughs> uh, that sounds like there could be some trouble on the horizon. Uh, or when we uh, talk about the Walking Dead game, uh, when you're playing that, you see uh, the uh, there's a police car that goes by. Now you're in a police car, but you hear woo, woo, you know, like the police car runs by. Now there's something on the radio, like it sounds like a, some kind of commotion, all points bolt and whatever. Uh, the driver turns the radio off, and then you see some more cop cars go by. You're not really sure, like what's going on? What's with these cop cars? They don't make a big deal about it, but you can tell it's just watching that. You think trouble is brewing. Something is starting to happen here. Uh, you know they don't spell it out. <laughs> <laughs> and they just give you enough clues to make you start thinking something is happening. And that's what it's interesting. You want to know, like, what, what is this? What's up with all these cop cars? Right. So you, you stay tuned. You want to see what happens. That's the trouble brewing stage. Uh, the argument against transformation. Uh, what happens here is that uh, the hero, for whatever reason, is reluctant. You know, they don't want to do whatever it is that they're going to need to do. 
Uh, you know, they want to just keep living in their happy land. They just want to keep their life is fine. They got this. <laughs> they don't want a big disruption uh, to their lifestyle. You know, the Bell talks a lot about Casablanca and how Rick, you know, Rick is just fine running his, uh, you know, casino or whatever. I forget the name of Casablanca or what, no, what is the name of his club? <laughs> anyway, he's fine just running this club. Uh, he doesn't want to get involved with this, uh, you know, all these Nazis and the uh, resistance and all this. You know, that's dangerous for him. He would rather stay out of it. Uh, nevertheless, he's kind of drawn into it. Uh, so you could think about that uh, same thing with your hero. And then at some point in Act 1, we get the first doorway of no return. So this is the thing that's going to force your lead into the second act, right? Something is going to happen here and there will be no going back. You know, this is, you know, this is the decisive moment. Uh, so they are now no longer in happy land. The status quo is disrupted and it's going to take a lot of effort. Maybe they'll never get back. Uh, so something big has occurred here. So he uses the example of uh, Wizard of Oz. You know, Dorothy and Toto, they're at the beginning. And uh, there's a little bit of trouble brewing, right? We know that the Toto's been, the little dog, I think, has dug up a garden of the neighbor. You know, there, there's some signs that things aren't quite as, that there's something happening. There's this talk about it. I think they mentioned the tornado, the cyclone. But anyway, the doorway happens, the first doorway of no return happens when the uh, cyclone picks up the house. <laughs> now they're out of Kansas. They're literally in a different place. Now they're in Oz. Uh, you know, there's no going back. You know, there's no easy way to get back there. You know, you could think of the same thing with the Hunger Games. There's that those moments or the Harry Potter. You know, is that point where he's not just going to be able to go back to his regular life. You know, now things are, are going to be different. We don't know how it's going to turn out. Uh, but th really the point is you can't just easily go back. He's kind of stuck there. and It's inevitable. He has to keep moving. Uh, that brings us to Act 2. So you see how you want to end Act 1 on that sort of moment of the, you know, they pass through the doorway and now you don't know what, something's going to happen. It's going to be big stuff. But now we're into Act 2. So that gives the reader or the player is really going to want to see what happens in Act 2, right? Uh, so again, we keep up this theme of the conflict, the tension, the confrontation. So Bell says, you need to kick them in the shins, right? So if you got this character thinking they're all that in a bag of chips, boom, something happens. They fail. Uh, they get defeated. You know, you read comic books and the, you got this, or watch WWE. <laughs> WWE is great for this. <laughs> you know, so you got this sort of hero who's kind of bragging, oh, I'm going to kick your butt. I'm just the best ever, you know. Uh, then he gets into the match uh, with this sort of wimpy wrestler and poof, gets his butt kicked. <laughs> You're like, oh, you know, it's a big uh, letdown. Uh, it really kind of gets knocked in his place. And, of course, that makes him think, okay, now I'm going to have to really up my game. I got to get serious. I wasn't all that I, it's not going to be easy. You know, it's, it's all those kind of emotions. And we're like, we like to see that sort of thing. We don't want to see just the invincible character, right? You want to see the character really get hurt. Um, and then they'll have to uh, really show their stuff. They'll have to change their ways if they want to succeed. It's not going to be good enough just to keep on keeping on. Uh, they talks about uh, the mirror moment. Uh, so this uh, bell, I think, is right here. There's some kind of moment where they have to confront themselves. You know, the idea is you're your own worst enemy. You have to overcome yourself. If you watched uh, the Star Wars movies, you know, Luke uh, Skywalker goes into this I don't remember, it's a tree or something. He has to fight his worst enemy. Of course, it turns out to be him. <laughs> uh, you see the same thing in a lot of comics. Uh, but there's basically this moment, or maybe they're just literally looking in a mirror, looking at themselves, talking to themselves, uh, and saying, you know, I'm the one, I have to overcome myself. I'm actually my, my enemy here. Either that or they say, you know, I'm looking at myself in the mirror. I'm not liking what I'm seeing. I need to change. <clears throat> They're kind of uh, confronted with themselves, and they don't like what they see. Uh, then he says, you know, you want to have this pet the dog moment. So he talked about the care package before. So here's the, the pet the dog moment. So they're going to stop and do something. Uh, again, this shows that they care, that they're not selfish. You know, maybe they're running away from the enemy. Maybe there's this big disaster. You know, I was just watching uh, The Expanse uh, last night, and I saw a pet the dog moment. Uh, so there was this uh, big tidal wave coming. It's going to kill everybody. 
and everybody's running, but the hero, the lead character, stops and sees a child that the child doesn't know. Uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the child, but anyway, <laughs> the kid doesn't know where his parents are, and so he's crying, like, "Well, I'm dead," you know. So the hero doesn't just run past, you know. That would be you'd hate it, hate it, see that, you know. <laughs> no, no, of course not. Stops, uh, goes over there, says, "What's the matter?" You know, and picks up the kid, takes him on, and wants to rescue the kid. Uh, so you see that, and that really kind of gets to you. You think, "Wow, this is a great hero." <laughs> you know, I probably would have just been too scared to stop and would have just keep running. Uh, but the hero, you know, the hero's gonna stop and uh, rescue the kid. Uh, or I guess, you know, pet the dog. You know, maybe they're literally a little puppy out there that's uh, scared. So they stop and uh, reassure the dog. Uh, second doorway of no return. So again, something that's inevitable that's going to force us into the next act. So it's, it's going to, the idea here, I think, is this idea of no return. And you know, that's the thing to focus on, right? It's, this is the thing. We can't go back, you know, to where it was before. This is a new, new act. <laughs> something big is Something colossal is going to happen here, hopefully even bigger than that first doorway of no return. Uh, it could be, they talk, some examples here, the crisis is, you know, maybe it's been ratcheting up the whole time. Now it's uh, to the point where something will have to be done or it's inevitable. Uh, if it's a mystery story, you know, this is the key discovery. If it's a sports thing, you know, this is the big setback right now. We've whoa, they just scored a touchdown and or two touchdowns, right? And it looks like it's, we're just not going to be able to win. <laughs> uh, or here's the decisive clue, you know, but something that has happened that's going to put us through there. We can't, again, can't just run back. The status quo again disrupted. Whatever kind of equilibrium was attained, now that is gone. If you watched a Battlestar Galactica, that series, you know, there was that first sort of big doorway was when uh, everything gets destroyed, right? Uh, but then there's the, the other doorway is when the Cylons are, are basically force uh, these people onto the, you know, <laughs> this big conflict. <laughs> oh, man, I could talk about Battlestar, but anyway, I won't bore you. Uh, the idea that just simply being you had something that happened in between Act 1, something at the end of Act 1 that there's no going back. Now they're in Act 2, same thing here at the end of Act 2, some kind of big event. Uh, act three then is the resolution. So, you know, the mounting forces. So when you watch, if you watch Game of Thrones, you know, they had the, all the big, big colossal armies, you know, big fight. Uh, it's at the sort of the peak intensity, you know, <laughs> uh, the, the last uh, round, you know, everything. Give them all you've got and then some, you know, that sort of thing. It's the darkest point for the hero. So it just seems like as hopeless as it could be. Uh, man, you know, the, the score is way, they're way behind on points. They're weak. They've been hitting the shins. <laughs> uh, just one thing, it's just going to, who knows if they're going to be able to, wouldn't it be miraculous if they were somehow able to win? Uh, the final battle, right? And then he talks about some other things to think about. The Q factor comes from James Bond movies. And uh, who is that author? Uh, I actually read some a bunch of his books. Cam Ian Fleming. There we go. Uh, so Q is this inventor guy, or a woman in some of the movies. But at the beginning of a James Bond film, uh, there's usually a scene where it's with Q, and they're given they're like, here's the pen that's also a camera and also a blowtorch or whatever. Here's the, you know, the little bomb that looks like a uh, pencil sharpener. I don't know. <laughs> you know, and your phone also is this and that. So there's all these gadgets, and you, it's not really clear. Usually Bond is looking at this very skeptically, like, what the hell? I, why would I need that? You know, that's going to be useless. Uh, it doesn't really think about it until the very end of the movie, right? So somehow at the very end, at this cliffhanger moment, like he's over the shark tank, about to fall in, suddenly remembers he's got this uh, pin, uh, this also a blowtorch. <laughs> he pulls that out and is able to save the day. So the, the Q factor... Now, the key thing about this, the absolutely critical thing, is you have to put the Q factor, uh, whatever that item is, has to be given an Act 1 uh, and come back later. You, you almost want the, per, uh, the reader or the player to forget about this until the end, because otherwise it'll just seem cheesy. It just looks like you're just, you just found an easy way for Bond to get out of the battle. 
uh, or get out of that shark tank. It just seems cheesy if it's right at the end, suddenly there's something that wasn't there before. Uh, so the idea is you establish this early on, you don't make too big a deal about it, and then uh, later on, though, it shows that it's uh, valuable. Uh, the final battle, I oh, already covered that one. Uh, the transformation, so maybe the character at this point has fully transformed into whatever he or she needs to be in order to uh, win that battle. And then the resonance, uh, this is that idea of the uh, the lines, uh, the, the something that sticks with you after the uh, show is over, uh, the curtain is down, you know, you're still kind of left there. It's kind of still percolating uh, the emotions, the feelings uh, with Game of Thrones. Uh, I don't know what your experience was like with that ending, if you saw the whole series, but for me, it really kind of stuck with me uh, with the, uh, <clears throat> you know, this idea of Daenerys. Maybe I shouldn't spoil this for you, but it kind of bothered me for a long time, and it wasn't necessarily that I thought that they should have ended it a different way. It just really kind of stirred me up emotionally, kind of resonated with me uh, a lot longer. I mean, I still think about it uh, even all these uh, months later. So think if there's something you could put at the end of your game uh, to end it in a certain way to get make people continue to think about it, uh, that's resonance. All right, that was, a, like I said, a very quick and dirty, dirty <laughs> analysis or just a summary of James Scott Bell. Now, I really suggest you at least read his guidebook. Again, that's on the D2L site uh, content section. And if you possibly, if it's at all possible, I would also get his books on the Kindle, I think it's called Plot and Structure. You can pick that up for a couple of bucks, read that on your Kindle or on the web, or just get the print copy. And then if you can watch that lecture series, that's on Great Courses Plus. And, you know, it's worth uh, it's worth every minute. If you got any interest at all in writing fiction, wow, you know, you're going to be uh, eternally grateful you saw that. Uh, okay, anyway, uh, we'll wrap this up here. If you do have any questions or comments, happy to answer those. But uh, see you next time. And good luck with your twines. I'm really looking forward to those. Hopefully you'll be able to use some of these techniques to make a really good game that's exciting.